Good morning. Um, I suppose you remember very well what we saw about Virgil and his bucolic poems, right? Um, we saw a lot about his life and what was um, the, um, the influence of his poems. And when it comes to the legacy of Virgil, um, it has to be stated that no other Latin poet is as quoted as he is. Maybe the only one who could contend with him and is not a poet is Cicero. Right. Um, but the influence Virgil had in the church fathers and in, in all through the Middle Ages is very remarkable. It's something worth highlighting because uh, he had a major influence. And today, I would like to analyze with you some of his bucolic poems. Those bucolic poems, or, or those eglogs, remember that eglog and bucolic poem are the same thing. Yes, bucolic poem comes from bucolos, which means the um, uh, cattle keeper, or um, eglog comes from ekloge in Greek, which means selected poems. So these are selected poems about uh, shepherds. Um, I want to uh, write some, uh, I, I want to highlight some things that you, I suppose you have already read in the anthology, right? Imagine after having read the anthology and having a well-grounded idea of what the content of the bucolic poems is, you, you come um, to your uh, exam and you find one of those poems. So the first question would be, how can you identify it, right? Um, well, if you, if you say, well, this is a passage taken from the second eglog, that would be amazing. But for the exam, it's enough if you tell me this is a book colleague poem written by Virgil. So you are stating what this poem is and who wrote it, Virgil, right? If you say, again, it was written between 42 and 39 BC, that's very precise and it's excellent, but as long as you say uh, first century BC or, um, uh, or second half of the um, first century BC, that's enough. Okay? So you are framing this poem in its temporal context. What kind of poem is it? Well, it's a pastoral poem. And how was it written? It was written in dact dactylic hexameters something that I have already mentioned and you, you, should, you should know even if you read it in a translation. You can also emphasize the mirror-like structure. And for example, um, a few years ago, I, wrote, um, I, I uh, put one of the uh, bucolic poems and yeah, definitely some brothers couldn't tell it was a bucolic poem. Some others could tell very well it was a bucolic poem and that was enough, but some others went a step further and said this is, um, this is taken from the ninth eglog, therefore it mirrors and resembles and has the same theme as the first. The first mirrors the ninth, second, the eighth, the third, the seventh, the fourth, the sixth, the fifth is like the culmination of all of them. And although the tenth could be regarded as an appendix, is not only an appendix because in all the other eglogs converge into that tenth eglog. Um, so that's the mirror-like structure. You can also see how, um, although this is a mirror-like structure, very symmetrical, there's something where they are not symmetrical at all. And it has to do with the intensity. The intensity. So the first egg log is very soothing, it's very relaxed. But intensity keeps increasing. And when you get to the ninth egg log, you see that it sounds almost like a crescendo from a symphony of Beethoven. So there's this intensity that, is, that keeps always increasing. And with those elements, you have fully identified the text, and I know that you know how to identify this poem. Causes. 
when it comes to causes, you can be as close or as removed as you want. And it's important to cover a wide span. Let's begin with the very, very um, close causes. Why did Virgil write these poems? If you want to be very, very, very specific, you can say, well, because he had a, uh, something to write with. But it's not, <laughs> it's not necessary to go that close. Uh, but, for example, it's important to mention Virgil's education. What education did he receive? Right? And you can mention that he received education in rhetoric, in law, in astronomy, in medicine, and he failed in all of those things. So, therefore, what was the um, where he where is where he found his true calling to poetry with a neoteric circle so this is all part of Virgil's formation and it's a very uh, closely connected cause to the writing of the egg loves another cause that is very closely related is the um, the war that um, Augustus waged against the assassins, of uh, the assassins of Caesar and how that led to the expropriation of the farms. Because that's a cause, that's an influence. We wouldn't have the bucolic poems if that hadn't happened. Of course, a war in itself doesn't create a great poem, but that was a remote influence, was, that, that was a close influence that made Virgil experience a lot of things in his own self. He experienced his own suffering, and that led him to writing the, um, the bucolic poems, that led him to writing the eglogs. Virgil himself had been dispossessed of his land. So that's a very closely connected cause. Virgil's own experience in, uh, living in northern, northern Italy uh, in the countryside and how he longed and admired and loved the countryside, that's also something very remarkable in, in the life of, um, of Virgil. And it's unmistakable. You can see Virgil's influence and how he was touched by that sense of awe, by that sense of wonder before the countryside, and how that is reflected in the bucolic poems. So here you have Virgil's own experience as a major influence and as a major cause within the, the frame of the bucolic poems. Do you see this? Yes. So I have spoken about those causes that are closely connected to um, Virgil and to the writing of the book of the bucolic poems. Now, are there more causes behi uh, behind this? Of course, and you can go almost always. You can go to Homer, regardless of who the who the author is. Not always, but almost always, you can find some relationship with Homer. Right. Why? Who created hexameters? And we find the, 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 um, the hexameter pattern, we find it in Virgil too. Although when it comes to the themes, maybe it would be a greater influence what we find in the works and the days. Right? Because he's speaking about the countryside. If the text that you are analyzing um, were the uh, Georgics, definitely it's uh, unquestionable. You have to mention the works and the days. But here in the Bucolic Poems, of course, you can also mention some kind of influence from the um, works and the days. Although, um, let's say that's the material he's working with. But what is the form? What is the content he's working with? Lyric poetry. And the, ex the expression of feelings is something that cannot be overlooked when you read the Eglogs, when you read the, read the bucolic poems, you definitely see how he is influenced by, um, by the great lyric poets. And finally, what's the influence of Greek tragedy? <laughs> 
dialogue. Don't you see it? Here we have, in every single bucolic, we have a dialogue. Or at least in most of them. Maybe the fourth one doesn't uh, look like a dialogue, but in most of the um, bucolic poems, you find a dialogue. And what is a tragedy but a dialogue? So this would be some of the causes um, that you can mention, right? Of course, you can also speak about a cause when it comes to um, the, the influence of Greek literature, although I think that is something general that we have already um, stated in at least four particular instances. When it comes to the consequences, so after this work was produced, what happened? What did it trigger? What's the influence, what's the legacy of this poem? And again, you can be as closely connected as Virgil in his own time and mention that thanks to the writing of these poems, he, rec he recovered his form. That's very close. And you can come all the way to the 21st century and see how it has influenced us. You don't have to mention that a uh, part of the influence of this poem is that we are seeing it in our literature course, but you can, right? Um, so I am just mentioning this to emphasize how close or how distant causes and consequences can be, right? Um, I don't need you to state what is obvious, like he had a writing device. That's a very closely connected cause, but um, I think that the, um, w when it comes to Virgil's education, when it comes to his own personal experiences, those are closely connected causes um, that are not so distant from Virgil and from the writing of these poems in themselves. Now, when we analyze the consequences, we have the, um, the consequences that can be very closely connected or they can be also very distant toward the future. And we can see how um, the influence of the egg logs re-echoes through history and through, them, um, through, through Western literature. So what, what would be the consequences? First, he recovered his land, but even more important, his fame. He was acclaimed. Um, he was only 28. And being 28, after the writing of them of the bucolic poems, he was a highly renowned poet. And if you consider the eglogs, they are pretty short, right? It's not like he had a bulky production, but the quality was undeniable. And that uh, made uh, Virgil leap into a probably the highest stand of fame that had been known up to that point. Another important uh, milestone that we find um, in the um, egg logs is how he revolutionized Latin poetry. Of course, we have predecessors like Lucretius, who had written a very smooth and very refined poetry, but they had not created a school and their influence had not been enough to change the course of Latin literature. Instead, uh, after Virgil, we find a major shift in the way um, literature is uh, studied and, and, and learned. Yes? Would you say that his fame was also because of the fact that people could identify with him? Maybe the northern Italians could identify with his writings and they were passionate about it? Um, the question is if his fame would also be due to the fact that people could relate with him. And maybe not everyone, but definitely a lot of people could relate with him. And unfortunately, we also have to acknowledge that we are in a very unequal society. So those who had access to uh, readership and those who had access to um, to Virgil's poems were the elite classes or the aristocracy, right? Um, and by the way, that's also an important point to highlight when it comes to the influence of Virgil, because he gave voice to those who had no voice. 
when, when we think about Theocritus, and it's also an, a, a very important cause, right? You remember Theocritus. Um, when we speak about Theocritus as an influence behind the bucolic poems, you can see that he also had written um, great bucolic poems in Doric dialect. And definitely um, Virgil borrows a lot from those poems. So sorry if I forgot mentioning that when it comes to the causes. But nevertheless, Virgil also refines and elevates the poetry of Theocritus. Why? Because in Theocritus, shepherds speak like aristocrats. So it's something quite artificial. It's not something that looks natural. The speech of a shepherd in, is not the speech that you would expect from a shepherd. Am I making this clear? Yes. Instead, when we read Virgil, we definitely find shepherds who speak like shepherds. And that is one of the uh, great achievements, and uh, that's a major part of the legacy of Virgil, that he has given voice to a group of people, to a social class, that had no voice in those times. Here. Verse 20 of the first Eglog. Urbem quam di cuntrum mam melibe putavi, stultus egoic nostres similem quo sepe solemus, pastores sovium teneros de pelere fetus, sic canibus catulos similis sic matribus edos, noram sic parvis componere magna soleva, verum mectantum malias intercaput exturit urbes, Quantum lenta solent inter virbuna cupresi. These are words that a shepherd, someone who's familiar with their rural life, would definitely say. What, what did I just say, by the way? Um, <laughs> Rome. I was... I was stupid. Imagine a shepherd saying this. Because I live here in the, in the countryside, and we... Pastores ovium, shepherds of sheep. Um, we usually compare things with um, what we know. So I thought that puppies were similar to dogs and little uh, kid goats were similar to the rams. Because as shepherds, we um, parvis componere mania soleva. I use, as a shepherd, I used to compare parvis mania, right? I used to compare small things with the larger things. So this shepherd, who has no culture, who has no experience, goes to Rome naively thinking that he will encounter Rome just like a big town, right? He thinks he's going to encounter in Rome just um, a settlement like the one, uh, like the farms where he lived. So he thought, okay, they are going to have just farmlands, but they are going to be larger. And when he comes to Rome, he's surprised and amazed and overwhelmed. Verse 25. Verum actantum alias intercaput exulit urbes. This city, Rome, has elevated its head so much on top of the other cities. Quantum lenta solenti inter virbuna cupresi. As much as, um, as, much as uh, the, the cypresses, you know the cypresses, the, the trees, as much as the cypresses uh, elevate above the bushes. So this is the voice of a shepherd. His fame. Then uh, how he revolutionized uh, Latin poetry. Another major consequence of the writing of the, bucol of the bucolic poems is um, his admission into the circle of Mecenas. And that was a life-changing event for Virgil. Because now he could completely dedicate himself to poetry, favored by his 
patron mecenas. As a consequence of this, then he would be commissioned with the Georgic poems and eventually the Aeneid for two very distinct per for two very different purposes. In the Georgics, he intended to elevate an almost idealized country life, especially in the hustle and bustle of a busy city like Rome. This was largely appreciated. The peace and the quietude of a uh, country life. And you can also see this in an incipient way when it comes to the bucolic poems. Right? You can see also that idealism for country life. And you can see how they see the country life almost like an idyllic realm where we shepherds, yeah, of course, you, sure, we have to take care of the goats and that they don't run away, but most of our time is dedicated to singing and cultivating the arts. So he wanted to elevate and create this idyllic view of country life. Um, eventually, as a consequence of these poems, you, you, I have already spoken about Sortes Virgiliane, which, has, uh, which is some kind of uh, divination through uh, the works of Virgil. I've spoken already about his reception in the Church Fathers. So that's a major consequence, how he influenced the Church Fathers, how he influenced Christian poets like Lacten Lactantius and Prudentius, um, especially the fourth eglog, and the major influence that he had with the fourth eglog. Uh, he's the most quoted poem, uh, poet of the Middle Ages. His sweet melancholy. I'm using this word as an oxymoron because usually you consider melancholy to be bitter. But in Virgil, we find some kind of sweet melancholy. And that is not something that we should take for granted because it's also a significant turn and a major shift in the way he addresses or he approaches several of these themes. We can find some dramatism in Virgil, right? But in the Eglogs, I will say that there's hardly any dramatism. There can be intensity, you, yes, sure, there can be intensity, but I, I don't see, um, I don't see that he cries out rending the heavens like Dido does in the fourth book of the Aeneid. So here we complain. We complain in, in, in a sad tone, but nonetheless, it's kind of sweet. And you can find all th that all through them, through the bucolic poems, and that's a major influence of, um, of Virgil. Definitely that's part of the consequences that uh, Virgil brought into the, the, um, the study of literature. And eventually he would be very studied during the Renaissance. In the Renaissance, they would, um, try to imitate his, his uh, eglogs. Um, there's a great poet of the Renaissance. He lived, I think, in the 1400s. Um, Giovanni Battista Mantuano. He was also from Mantua. Oh. And um, he was a Carmelite. He was a Carmelite friar. And he wrote great poems after uh, following the footsteps of, of Virgil. Um, definitely, you can also see the influence he had in Dante and in Purgatory, they find a snake. Latet Anguis in Nerva, it's almost a copy paste that Dante used precisely from the bucolic poems. Petrarch um, is, is also one of the great authors of the Renaissance who was um, influenced in a major way by, by Virgil the Spanish Golden Century, of course, or in English poetry, Dryden. So you find all these consequences, like the influence, the repercussions, the echo that Virgil had uh, through, the, um, uh, through the story, uh, th through the history of literature. Finally, let's try to highlight a few elements about his context. Where do we frame this poem? What is the environment surrounding this poem? Unlike 
what it describes, we find a very busy and tumultuous environment. We find all the hustle and bustle of the city of Rome. And he's writing th that in that context precisely because he longs, he yearns, he, um, he, he, he aspires to that peace and that calm of um, country life, where he finds that particular sh charm. Um, let's move on to a broader picture. From, from what you know of history, when was this written? During the Pax Romana, following the Civil War. So it was a period of re relative peace that enabled um, politicians to favor the arts. So these artists and these writers would extol the glories of the empire. An even broader context would be the fascination that Romans experienced before the Greek culture. And although I definitely think Virgil outstrips Theocritus, Nonetheless, the influence of Theocritus is undeniable. So this is a part of just um, this is just a part of that that major context uh, where we find um, an entire people fascinated by the culture of the Greeks, and we also find the the context of the country life because up to the um, high Middle Ages, most of the world population lived in the countryside, in rural areas. Um, so that's also a, a remarkable part of the context. So that would pre be pretty much it. The, uh, I have stated what the elements of a text commentary are, and I would expect you to identify them, the text. I would expect you to be able to tell me what the causes behind this, this text are. What are the consequences? So what happened after this text was written? And finally, uh, what's the context, right? What's the context? Let me just make a few commentaries about, um, a, a few comments about uh, some of uh, the eglogs. Titere tu patule recuban sub tegmine fagi, silvestrem tenui musa meditaris avena, nos patrie fine se dulci alinqui musarva, nos patriam fugimus tu titere lentus in umbra, Formo sam resonare doces amarili da silvas. The peace this poem evokes from the very beginning is something worth highlighting. And recubans, lying, um, sub tegmine fagi, under the, um, um, the foliage of this tree. And you are um, practicing, meditaris, you are uh, practicing. Um, Silvestrem Musam. What is the muse? The art. The art of the countryside with tenui avena, with a um, um, thin flute. Nos patria fines et dulcia linquimus arva. So here we find the contrast. You are laying down and you are playing the flute while nos patria fines et dulcia linquimus arva. While we are leaving the confines of our fatherland and our dulcia arva and our sweet uh, plowing fields um, nos patriam fugimus we are fleeing from our own fatherland tu titere lentus in umbra formosam resonare doces amarillita silva so here we find almost like the, a sandwich structure where we have titeras then we find us and then we find titeras uh, again and this verse has <laughs> There was a comedy where a scholar dedicated 10 years of his career to studying this Formosan Resonare de Ches and Marili da Silvas. Because we have a double accusative. We have um, doches, meaning you will teach, you will teach, that is very clear, what? Silvas Resonare Amarili da Silva, eh, amaril, you will teach the forest to resonate with art, and of course, Amarli, Amarli, Li, Amarilis, who is the muse, is the symbol of the art. So we, you will teach the forest 
to resonate with art or you switch the accusatives and you will teach the art to resonate with with the muse we, um, sorry with the forests you will teach the art how to resonate with the forest meaning will you incorporate the forest into the art or will you incorporate the art into the forest and that ambiguity <laughs> um, eventually would come uh, to serve as a standpoint for a comedy <laughs> where a, uh, of course it's, it's fiction but this scholar supposedly dedicated 10 years to analyzing who teaches whom or what teaches what and at the end of his research <laughs> they ask him so what have you found so far and he says nothing yet <laughs> <laughs> and the antithros the, the shepherd who's lying peacefully oh melibe deus nobis et oxia fecit and let me just press fast forward this is a very very beautiful uh, passage but i think i have already read it to you right um so who's that god the emperor himself right sepetenera um, um, so there will always be a, sac a fresh sacrifice on my altar to that God, who is the emperor. He is the one who has enabled me to play the flute here in the fields, and he is the one who has uh, enabled my, my um, calves to um, to go wide to, to go um, through the wide fields and and of course we don't know uh, who that uh, god is at first it could be the emperor but it could also be certamen iste deus quisit da titere nobis da understand that da not la, like to give but like to say so tell us O titerus who is this god and what is the response urbem quam di cunt romam melibe putavi notice this so far the verses have been flowing very smoothly with dactylic hexameter right long short short long short short long short short and everything is flowing very smoothly. O melibe e deus nobis et totia fecit, nam quarit ile mi deus semper ili usara, se petenera nobis abovili busim vuet anu. But here, it's, it's almost like he stumbles. Urbem quam di cunt romam melibe putavi. So we have a, lo a lot of long syllables, but not because he's stumbling. That's because this is the most solemn moment of the whole eglog. Where he's speaking about urbem quam dicunt romam. The city which they call Rome. That is the god I worship. Of course, symbolized in the emperor himself. And then uh, there comes the, the passage I have already read. Where he says, uh, that city... Putavi stultus ego uic nostre similem. I thought that city was, I, I naively thought that city was going to be just like our countryside in a larger scale. Um, and we have that beauty. And then Melibeus um, adds Fortunate Senex, it ic inter flumina nota, et fontis sacros frigus captavis opacum. So the lyricism he evokes with these poems is maybe something that has rarely been achieved in, in, in the history of literature. Um, you are a fortunate old man. Ic inter flumina nota, you are surrounded by a familiar rivers et fontis sacros, and you are surrounded by sacred fountains, um, frigus captavis opacum. And notice the opacum. What is opacum? Dark, right? But dark is something visual, right? Instead, he's saying frigus captavis opacum. You will feel the dark freshness, meaning he's under the shadow. Um, 
Ictibi cuese, eh, cuesen per vicino ablimine sepes, y la beisa pium florem de pasta salicti, se pelviso num sua debit in ire susurro. Please listen to this. Se pelviso num sua debit in ire susurro. What is he speaking about? The bees. The bees, while you are um, laying um, in the peace and the quiet of this shade, um, the, the bees, what are the bees going to do? They are going to inspire sweet rest into you. And how does he say it? Se pelevis omnum sua debit in ire susurro. So with their murmur, they are going to, um, they are going to invite you to sleep. Anyway, um, I think we're running out of time, um, so I think uh, we can finish with this. Next class, um, please read what you have in the anthology of Ovid, and I'm going to make a few commentaries about that, a few comments about that, okay?